I'm, I'm not expecting a call, I'm just going to time myself to make sure I'm, I'm not tardy. Tenekoto, tenekoto, tenekoto kato. Kia ora, and welcome to my portion um, of this presentation. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, as we mentioned, my name is Kate Brady Keane. I'm a Sroptimist from Auckland, New Zealand, and I've worked for 15 years with women and children in the fields of domestic and sexual violence in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the USA, and back in the UK. First of all, I want to thank my colleagues and my fellow panellists for sharing your stories here today. It's amazing to see the work that's being done around the world at this time, and it's amazing to hear what's being done for women and children in our society. However, still, when I hear these stories, I can feel overwhelmed. I feel um, that at times, the amount of information that comes to us can leave us feeling as though, what can we do? It can leave us feeling helpless and hopeless. And really, what we need is some skills to take forward. When I was asked to speak on this subject, I began to look at the projects I've been involved in over the years. I began thinking about the statistics that we all know so well. One in four women will experience violence in their lifetime. One in three women will experience sexual violence. One in four girls will experience sexual violence or rape before she's 16. These are statistics that we know too well and that we hear constantly. But then I stopped to think about prevention and actually what prevention means in relationship to the work that we do and the outcomes that we can have for these women and children across the world. As I mentioned, at times it can feel so overwhelming to work in the field and I imagine to hear the information that you've had over the last few days here at this conference. And sometimes I find that placing that work in a larger context, one, allows me to stay sane and to continue doing the work I'm doing, and gives me something so solid to hold on to and a solid ground to stand on as I move forward and help more women and as I move forward and hear more stories. Prevention and primary prevention have become buzzwords in our sector over the last decade. With funders, governments, and policy, reports, frameworks often wanting prevention and in particular primary prevention to be a focus of any programme that's being run. We often focus on this area, but what I'd like to do today is just take a moment to stop and actually think what primary prevention means, what that looks like, and how we can use these tasks in our everyday life to empower the women and children around us and to give ourselves a solid ground to stand on as we hear these stories and as we move forward in our own work. So according to the White Ribbon Foundation, primary prevention strategies are implemented before the violence occurs. These strategies aim to lessen the likelihood of boys and of men using violence and in the, fir in the first place and women suffering in the first place. What I notice is they did miss girls out of this, um, this area and what I'd like to say is primary prevention is to help stop girls and women suffering in the first place. There are three acknowledged types of prevention strategies. We have primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary, as mentioned, occurs before the violent event occurs. It may take the form of education programs in schools, in communities, in colleges, in churches. It may appear in the form of early childhood education, information on drugs and alcohol and substance misuse. In New Zealand, we have some great programs that look at this primary prevention. One is called Sex and Respect which is run through um, rape prevention education and is, done, is a programme that's done through high schools. So it's engaging and allowing young people to think about healthy sexual relationships, what that means, how we may engage in this. So whilst it's an education programme, its focus is to get people to think differently. It's to give people different information in ways to think. We also have another programme, a preschool programme called We Can Keep Safe, which is an awesome programme that's run by um, two actresses actually, to um, moderately famous um, female um, actresses in New Zealand and they go into preschools, into kindergartens and they run a programme for seven days, an hour a morning helping young people understand what good touch and bad touch is to actually name their body parts so if something does happen to these young people they're actually fully equipped with the information to tell people what has happened and it's also a very empowering process for parents as I think as one of my colleagues mentioned for some it's the first time they actually get to have these conversations with their young people some people say starting at this age, it is too young, but I think equipping women and young girls with information about who they are and their rights is never something that can start too young, as long as it's done in an appropriate age appropriate way. So primary prevention is information, 
given before the event to stop the abuse happening. Secondary prevention, which is also known as early intervention, occurs when an at-risk group is identified. So either a potential or a group that may have an increased potential to offend, or a group that may be at increased risk, increased vulnerability. The aim is to look at behaviours and attitudes and to target them before they're fully established, before they're um, acted upon, and to increase awareness of those who are at risk in either camp. These, implement, these um, focuses could be, could be implemented in schools where maybe there's been a rash of sexual assault or rape. They could be implemented in neighbourhoods or communities where there is an increased risk of domestic violence or gendered violence. But secondary, again, is before the violence takes place, but with targeted groups. So tertiary prevention looks at the responses that occur after the violence has taken place. It deals with the immediate and long-term impacts for survivors, and it looks to contain, help, and manage um, both the immediate ex experience and to prevent the offender reoffending. The primary, secondary, tertiary, all focusing on and addressing change in behaviour and thought, but at different cycles of the offending cycle. What we want to be really clear is not to confuse primary prevention and prevention programmes and education programmes. The focus of a prevention programme is to promote behaviour change and to increase knowledge of gendered violence. Now this is often done through education programmes and certainly raising awareness and education is a very good byproduct of a prevention programme. But the prevention programme is not to increase knowledge particularly, it's to help people challenge ways of thinking and to help change behaviour. According to the Victoria Health Board, the goal of prevention programmes are to reduce the overall incidence of gendered violence. It looks at the factors and the conditions, such as gender inequality, patriarchy, gender socialisation, social norms that facilitate, excuse and create gendered violence supportive cultures. Prevention programmes, the, the focus of prevention programmes is to challenge thinking and attitudes around violence which will produce, or hope to produce, different behaviours in individuals. Because we know the act of committing violence is always a choice. People choose to commit violent acts, and what we need to do is equip people with different ways of thinking and being in the world to challenge this. So there are many factors that influence individuals' way of thinking. Seeing the world and behaving. And it's these ways of thinking that need to be gently challenged, and there are many ways to do that. But what I'd like to do is just give one example here today that you may hopefully take away with you and may give you something to work with and maybe, maybe solidify the, step, the ground that you sometimes stand on when faced with issues such as gender violence. So one way to look at this is through language. Now, there is only so much language in the world and we do not create our own language. Language is given to us based on space, place and time. Where we're from, the time that we live in and the culture and community that sits around us. I was told this was a chair. As a child, I was given language that helped me understand what this was. I didn't create this word, I didn't create the concept, it was learned based on space, place and time. I know that there's different chairs in the world, I kind of know those are chairs as well. I know there's different chairs in my living room, I know my office may have a bit of a different chair. In my culture I know what to do with a chair. I know how to sit on it, like a lady, as we may have been taught. Um, I also know that if somebody comes into a room who's maybe older than me, or pregnant, or has children, that it's my cultural role to move and give somebody else that chair. I know all these things about chairs, but I don't consciously think of that when I interact with the chair. I see a chair, and I usually just sit on it and do what I need. So even though I have this wealth of information sitting behind me, in the moment I interact with the chair and the cultural appropriateness of, cultural appropriateness of this without really thinking. I'm a woman. I grew up with an understanding of what a woman was, what being a woman was. For each of you, if you just take a moment to think, you will also grow up with an understanding of what a woman was. You were given language to understand it, you were given context and space, place and time to understand what a woman was. 
When people interact with me, there are a million different things that inform how they would interact with me as a woman. They're not consciously thinking of them every moment, but they're there. Because it's, it's, it's hereditary, it's given to us, it's an understanding. Um, but it's not necessarily always conscious. But it's based within their own space, place, time and understanding. The language that they've been given to understand the context of a woman. I was just recently at home. I, I live in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, my family live back in the UK. I just went home and um, three, four different aunts at least came up to me and the first thing they said to me is, where are your children? Like I, like I left them at home or I forgot to pack <laughs> Because for them, they can't understand the context of a 35-year-old woman not having children. And they're lovely women. They love me very much. They, they care for me. But for them, the, the idea, the context of me not having children is, is just too hard. So before, how are you doing? How's your job? Congratulations for getting to go to a conference in the UN. Where are your children? <laughs> it's the context of where they grew up and how they understood the world. So how does this apply to prevention programs? So the goal is to offer a wider context, a different understanding, other language to understand people, places and time. If you've grown up with a specific idea of what a woman is, a specific idea of what masculinity and what femininity is, then sometimes preventing the goal of a prevention program is to gently challenge that idea, to give people different contexts to think about masculinity and femininity, to give people different contexts and ideas to think about violence, to think about gender, to think about responsibility. There are many ways in which we can approach this, but simply, on a basic level, sometimes by just widening people's understanding of the world, we can help shift the way people think by giving them more language, which can result in a change in behaviour. So it is, but this is also quite culturally specific as well. So what I've heard time and time again from this conference is not with us, sorry, not for us, with us. So as you're working with different cultural contexts, as you're working with different people, it's so important to engage them and involve them in the prevention programmes that you do. If we go back to my chair, in my culture it's fine for me to sit on one chair and maybe have my feet on another chair. It's not a huge no-no. But in some cultures that would be very inappropriate. It would be inappropriate to put feet on a chair, it would be inappropriate to show the soles of my feet. I wouldn't necessarily know that from my worldview. So the importance of inviting people from different worldviews to be involved in the creation of these programs I think is essential. So back to the chair. Always about the chair. <laughs> so what I hope to do today is to just give you some information to take forward. As I said, working in the field, I at times can feel extremely overwhelmed by the information that comes at me. And certainly being in this forum has been an amazing experience, but at times it can feel like there's so much going on in the world and what can I do about it? What changes can I make? And we can at times be left feeling quite helpless and hopeless. So hopefully by understanding language as a context and maybe helping understand and explain to those around you about different ways of seeing the world, we can help shift and change the attitudes of those around us and help keep ourselves grounded in the work that we do and the information that we hear. Kia ora.